Welcome everybody, and what I hope is that there's something in this for everybody, right? So, I am an engineer, I did study here. When I graduated here in 1968, engineers didn't get paid very much money. They still don't get paid the best money, but they get paid a lot more than I did. And some of my friends, they went off to be chartered accountants, because they, chartered accountants got paid twice as much as engineers. But I stuck at my engineering, I started in research and development, and one of the things I believe in is following my passions, and I always had a passion for electronics. I had an electrical outfit when I was eight, and I had a radio and TV repair business when I was 13. And all I've done is follow my passions, and I think, I say that to the kids I talk to, if you can find out what your passions are and you can follow them, you might have a chance, right? And as the Blink-182 song says, life is too short to last long, right? So you better make the most of it. So, I'm, and, and basically I, I did my R&D, uh, I gave a talk to the Royal Television Society called TV and Chips. It was a bit of a joke. They were microchips. Um, I gave that to the Royal Television Society, and through that, Motorola hired me and gave me a lovely company car. And so, one of the other things I say to the kids, I am a fan of the IET, I joined this institution, because the year I graduated, a professor here, whose name is Professor Meek, he was uh, the president of the IET, and he says, You should all sign up for this, it will do you good, right? So, and that's the other thing I want to give you is. You sit exams, you get worried, you have spreadsheets, but life is about people and contact, so it's lovely to be a liberal. We started it, but we started on the company at the end of 1990, so the, the key thing, and this is how I became Sir Modern Saxby, had lots of failures in my life, and eventually I got it right. Getting it right is all about failing and picking yourself up. So this is the story of the ARM architecture. For the non-technical of you, ARM is a microprocessor, it was also a company, and Acorn, the company, some of you know the BBC microcomputer, the Acorn Archimedes, a friend of mine called Herman Hauser, who was the CEO of Acorn some while back, uh, he decided that the team there would build a RISC microprocessor. And RISC is reduced instruction set computing. The idea of RISC is it goes faster than SIS. Okay, so they invite, designed a chip called the ARM1, and basically, they got a great team of R&D engineers, and they got a great chip, but actually they only made about 50,000 computers a year, and there are also competitors out there like Intel, and uh, every major electronics company, Motorola, Xilog, National Semiconductor, uh, all the Japanese companies, Fujitsu, Toshiba, uh, Samsung, they're all building their own chips. So, uh, but Acorn had a chip that was pretty good. Uh, but the problem is, of R&D for a little company like Acorn is how do you afford to pay the R&D costs and how do you take the business forward? And actually what was happening is the Acorn uh, Archimedes computer was really losing market share because along with it was coming Apple and the PC. And in reality, Acorn's market was people who watched the BBC microcomputer program. So, so their business wasn't going the right way and they had an expensive R&D team. There was a guy at Apple called Larry Tesla who was the chief scientist of Apple, and he liked this ARM architecture, and he wanted to use it for a product called Newton, and Newton came failed handwriting tablet. So again, yeah, remember the word failure, but the, app, the, the Newton turned into the iPhone. So in engineering, generally speaking, you have one or two failures, and if you're lucky, you might get some success. And usually my, my view of start of a, a new technology to success, realistically, you're looking at a minimum cycle of 10 years are more likely 20 years, okay? So learning how to fail and pick yourself up, I think, is part of, part of good engineering. Um, so what happened is Larry was interested in this technology, and Apple were interested in it, and VLSI Technology, which is another American company, were building these chips for Acorn. And uh, VLSI said to Larry, um, Acorn are thinking of starting, uh, spinning this technology out into an independent company. And that's where I came along. In the summer of 1990, I got a headhunting phone call saying, Acorn are thinking of spending, spinning this out into a joint venture. Apple are thinking of investing, but unless they have a CEO, uh, it's not going to happen. Can I have a chat? So I had a chat, and I, have, I still have the paperwork of the dialogue I had between about August and December of that year about the startup and what the business model would be. And that was my major contribution, I think. So, I think that's the other message. I had worked in the semiconductor industry from 1973 till uh, we created ARM at the end of 1990. So I had 
20 odd years of experience of the semiconductor industry, I was actually president of an American company, US2, in Silicon Valley, and also experience in Japan, in Tokyo, and I was a seasoned, if you like, in inverted commas, semiconductor <coughs> veteran. And what I'd say to anybody who's thinking of starting a business, good technology is important, but people who understand the market, the competition, the customers, are probably even more important because actually the world is full of great technology, and um, but it isn't full of how you apply that technology to meet a customer need, and I think that's where I was successful. So what happened is we formed the joint venture of the 20th, uh, 28th of November 1990. I was the first CEO. I was actually CEO, president, chairman, and everything because we just had 12 engineers and me, and I did the marketing brochure. I did the PR, I did the travel, I even took my circuit diagrams out in meetings in Japan because we're a very small, lean and mean startup. And so that was the foundation of ARM. And the first product we created was something called the ARM 6, uh, which, and the ARM 610. The ARM 610 was used in the Apple News. And, and the first few years, we were honestly struggling to stay alive. We had, we had 1.5 million pounds of seed capital. And that money was due to run out within a year or so. The truth is the 12 founding engineers of Acorn thought that we'd all be bankrupt and Acorn would cast them off. But I persuaded one guy called Jamie Eichrott, who was the most senior of the 12 engineers of the team in Acorn, that we could become the global risk standard. So my vision was, what if we will become the global risk standard? And to everybody's surprise, we did it. Okay? And then more things happened. So our first licensee of papers money was GC Plessy, and then after that came Sharp in Japan, and then after that came Cirrus Logic in America, and Texas Instruments, and so on and so forth. And what happens is the early years, the one, years one, two, and three, they're the ones where you really struggle. And once you start to get successful, momentum kicks in. And we had, after, by about 1994, 1995, everybody was queuing up wanting to license on when we turned a corner. One of our weaknesses was the, um, the conventional chip technology had, what, what, for those of you who are into computers and stuff, they had good code density, and a RISC computer doesn't have good, good code density. <coughs> what that means is the size of the program to do a particular job in a, an old SIS technology was smaller than in a RISC technology, and that meant the cost of the RISC memory footprint was more expensive with RISC than CISC. So we invented something called FUN, and I think that is the most important invention of ARM. It happens, it, the joke is the thumb fits on the end of the ARM, by the way, and it's the 16-bit implementation of a 32-bit ARM, which dramatically improves the code density. Another weakness we had, we had major competitors like MIPS in particular, like Intel, like Motorola. We didn't have a very performant ARM chip. It, we had chips that were good at low power, good at low cost, but we didn't have a high performance, so we teamed up with Digital, and we, had, we did something called strong arm, which actually was strong and powerful and fast, and that was how we got there. And then Intel, by the way, bought, uh, uh, bought Digital. That was another interesting challenge. And in 1998, we went public. We duly listed on NASDAQ and London. Uh, and that was a good idea because American markets at the time valued technology more than London markets. Uh, and then in 1998, on paper, I was wealthy. We actually created 200 millionaires uh, on the, uh, in the year we went public. Because I am a great believer in share options. All employees had share options. But I do believe, again, the, in life, you know, there's like a boss, there's like a... Everybody in the team should make a contribution. And just because you're the boss doesn't mean you're any good. You might be good at something, but there will be other people that are good at, uh, at other things, and, you, and it's about the team. So I believe that share options in a startup are a very good idea, because startups, you pay less salary, you work longer hours, you do more work, there's got to be some upside somewhere if you make it successful. This journey, uh, it took about eight years to go public, but it's like we never happen, we'll ever go public, we'll ever make money, and that's another risk of startups, if you like. And something else that also helped us, we were in a European collaborative project, which is called the Open Microprocessor Systems Initiative, that I actually chaired. And I was, we were getting in years two, three, and four about £400,000 a year from Europe. And without that project, we probably would have gone bankrupt, right? So this is another interesting issue we have at the moment uh, in this world. I'm not black and white about any politics, but uh, what the European collaboration gave us, as well as money, was we established an on-chip standard bus called AMBA within this European project. So I am a fan of European R&D projects. Uh, and then what happened is, 
So after we went public in 98, I stayed CEO immediately after that. I'm a great believer in succession <laughs> planning and I stopped being CEO at 54. Did that a year earlier, that's when Warren took over. And I said I want to stop being chairman at the age of 60, and I think I stopped doing that at the age of 61. So I do believe in planning. So Warren took over as CEO. He is now the CEO of Rolls Royce. Warren is somebody I hired and we're still good friends. I retired from Warren in October 2007. Um, and Simon Seegers is the current CEO of Arm. He's somebody I employed as about employee number 16. And you probably noticed in September of 2016, uh, SoftBank acquired Arm uh, for about 23 billion pounds, I think, which is not bad, you know, for a 1.5 million C investment. And this Simon is now on the main board of SoftBank. So in the life of Arm, private company, money from America, money from Japan, we've got Japanese investor as well in about 1993. Uh, it's always been a global company and it just happens to be owned by some Japanese this week. Anything can happen in the future. And that's a re I retired from ARM in 2007, but you can click on that and see the milestones and the history of ARM going forwards. So, how did it happen? I am a very big, big believer in SWOT analysis. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. I think you can apply this to anything, by the way. Whatever it is you want to do, if you do a SWOT analysis, I think it's a very good start and it's a tool I learned from Motorola. And I got this team of 12 founding engineers to do the SWOT analysis. So I told them what SWOT was. I didn't actually contribute to this analysis at all. And you see they did it on the 18th of December, 1990. So the 12 founding team, who had virtually no commercial experience, they're all engineers, came with this analysis. And what they said is the ARM architecture is low power, that means it's good on batteries, it's low cost, it's cheap actually, it's simple and it's small. And this 12 man founding team was flexible, responsive, dynamic, successful, enthusiastic, and they had excess, extensive systems expertise because basically they had designed the Acorn Archimedes computer in chips so they could do the chip layout, but they could also do the software. They did the operating system called RISCOS. And in this 12 person team, they happened to be all men, but you know, could be different today. Um, they had a broad experience and that was pretty good. Uh, weaknesses, zero market share, zero market profile, zero revenue, zero marketing expertise, limited resources. If you wanted to program an ARM chip, you need an Acorn Archimedes computer, and we want to be the global standard, and there's only about 100,000 Acorn computers out there, that's not going to work, is it? Didn't know much about characterization, test and manufacturing, and there was a reliance on one foundry manufacturing. So they had one partner, VSI technology, and nobody else had made an ARM chip. <coughs> what did we see as the opportunity? We said portables. Portables turned out to be digital mobile phones. But at the time, digital mobile phones hadn't arrived. They were still analog at that time. But we said portables. The big market for microcomputers is embedded control. That means everything in your printer, in camera, all the bits of stuff in your electronics product, and that was the volume market. Automotive, cars, radiation hard, that again, a few of those. And we said again, places and partnership, Japan and the Far East, this European project, OMI, silicon manufacturers, silicon users, silicon distributors, Apple, get a bit of money from them, because they were the only, only part who had any money, because Acorn didn't really have lots of money, although we did get a bit out of them, and some consultancy threats. Big rivals, okay? That was every semiconductor company on the planet. Texas Instruments, Intel, National Semiconductor, LSI Logic, uh, Toshiba, 150 competitors, all with hundreds of millions of dollars and people to kill us. We going to be a, the world's global standard and an intellectual property company, and we don't have any patents. Only that's not so good. Small team relying on individuals. We had, we're working very long hours. Existing commitments, so for the foundation of the company, we had to do this chip for Acorn, which is a floating point accelerator, that used half the engineering resource of the company, and only 500 of those chips were ever sold, right? So that wasn't particularly good. Um, and we had a single customer at present, that was Apple, and we had no control over our income. So that was the foundation swap that these engineers did. So, this is where I came along with my experience. So with all those weaknesses, the only way we're going to succeed is with, if we become the global standard, really. And I actually said we will be the global risk standard with the words I use. 
Everybody said I was mad, I probably am, but anyway, we did it. And everybody says, what's he talking about? How can we do that? We've only got five shillings and six, but it's not going to be. We'll be bankrupt. But Jamie said, yeah, I think we might do it. And then we also said, we need to create a partnership business model in order to succeed. We needed to create a community to have a standard architecture to make this work. We turn our enemies into our friends. <coughs> we needed to develop sales and marketing skills and family engineers. So in my previous job, which was US2, uh, this was a startup which was doing direct right on wafer e-beam stuff. And the bad news about US2, the technology didn't work. And I had to fire most of the people there to try and get to break even. I, I was doing that. I thought, well, if we start lean and mean and grow the business as the income comes in, that's better than having to fire everybody. So with this 12 family team, I put Jamie in charge of sales. He was at the head of VSI. I put Mike, who wore a purple tie, I put him in charge of Mike marketing. And I put Tudor in charge of engineering. And we, we just did it, basically. Started building a patent portfolio. We got uh, some external patent agents, and we got that building. And then software design tools on a PC, we did that. And then the key benefit of ARM, which is where the technology was better than anything on the planet, we had the best MIPS per watt, which is performance over power consumption. And we had the best MIPS per dollar, which is performance over cost. And that's how we could win. And everybody's saying, you didn't get this to mobile phones. Mobile phones never need a risk architecture. Fortunately, they were on, we were right. And then the other key thing is we'll enable this chip to be embedded within a system chip and we'll turn it into a standard. And then we identified key end users. So the people we got the money from were the semiconductor companies like Plessy, VLSI, Sharp, Texas Instruments, Samsung, OSI, Logic. But we understood what the needs of their end customers were in order to make sure the architecture fitted with those needs. So in fact, with Apple, which was doing this Newton, the chip supplier was Plessy and VLSI. Sharp, our first Japanese licensee, the big design one was the Nintendo Game Boy Advance. Nokia, which was the first really successful product, it was the Nokia, Nokia 6310. That's why we invented the thumb architecture. Samsung, I, I had a meeting with Samsung in about 1992, by a guy called Hyam Lee Rowe, and he is a really great guy, Dr. Hyam Lee Rowe, and we talked about the benefit of embedding risk processors in everything that Samsung made. And he got the idea and they did it. And it's been hugely successful for Samsung. If you look at where Samsung is technologically today, that was almost the foundation of their success. Similarly with Nokia, the Nokia 6310 at the time over to Ericsson and Motorola. So win, 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 win is the business idea. And then now I saw what we got into uh, discharge and so on. So from the starting of on, we also thought about community. Who's going to add value to this architecture? So we had silicon partners, these are the people who built the chips. We had design, design support partners who could give consulting design advice. Software partners, people like Microsoft, people like uh, real-time operating system companies. Training partners, systems partners, standards bodies and so on. Again, LMI is part of that. And basically, we, we turned an architecture which had one chip supplier, VLSI technology, one customer, Acorn, uh, and uh, no software really into the global standards. So at today's date, I'd like to thank you all because you've all got lots of ARM products in your pocket. I am, it doesn't help me anymore because I'm retired and I don't have any shares, but every time you buy a chip with ARM in it, ARM gets a few cents of royalty. So the business model was about <laughs> licensing the technology for a few million pounds, and every time somebody uses a chip, a, a few cents, maybe 10 or 20 cents. And so the good news is, uh, the total number of ARM chips sold on the planet today is more than 100 billion. So the ARM architecture is by far the most popular architecture on the planet, overtaken Intel and everything else. And we kind of did it, right? And what I say is since I you know, graduated here and I struggled with my exams and I'm still alive, if I can do it, any can, anybody can do it really. Um, and, but, what, but what I would say is you've got to have ambition. You've got to think beyond the possible and back up to reality. And there's nobody who doesn't use ARM today, including Intel. So what are the lessons? And this is where technologists in particular, I think, struggle a bit. Still the existing markets and understand the leading team the customers, their needs, who your competition is, and learning what is. I'm very heavily involved in quite a few startups today. And it's quite normal for startups to not pay enough attention to the competition, be too arrogant about their own technical advantages, and not think it through properly. Another reason why I believe ARM was successful, and this is part of my international experience, 
I had the board particularly able and saying, hire more engineers in the UK, hire more engineers in the UK. I said, no. I hired a guy called Tim O'Donnell in Silicon Valley who had worked for me before at US2. He, he actually insisted on me hiring him. He wouldn't leave my swimming pool in my hotel in the Sheraton Silicon Valley until I'd offer him a job. And I was, <laughs> I was with Tim in Hawaii just the other day for uh, Halloween in Hawaii, which is a fun place to go for Halloween, by the way. Probably the best place to go for Halloween, I do recommend it. Street parties there are pretty good. And Tim, uh, he, Tim was an applications engineer, but what I said to him was it takes as long to develop the customer as it takes to develop the technology we need somebody in Silicon Valley. So we hired Tim as employee number 18 when they were telling me to hire lots of engineers. We hired Takio Ishikawa, which is trying to mean Rocky River in Japan, Japanese, as about employee number 33 in Tokyo. We hired a guy called Sam Kim in Korea. We hired a guy called Jun Tan in China and so on. So these people, again, it's about cultural stuff, it's about language, and the classic British thing is fly in, fly out. As soon as you've left, it's all changed. So you need local eyes on the ground. And then these people become uh, company presidents later. So Arm, I think, has over a thousand engineers in Bangalore now. So I really believe very strongly that unless you're global, unless you're globally successful, forget it. And if you look at where China is today, or India is today, versus where they were when we started on, that momentum uh, is gathering more and more pace, and any startup anywhere can do good stuff, provided they've got the right, right context. And then the other thing is customer pull is more important than technology push. If you can solve an explicit need of a customer, you might get a purchase order. And the example I give of this is, supposing I wanted to sell you a parachute, right? Would, would anybody like to buy a parachute? I guess you're not too interested in parachute. Can you imagine if you were falling out of a plane and I'm coming by and I can clip a parachute on your back and I say, how much will you give me for that parachute? <laughs> so that is the explicit need of the customer. If you understand that, you might get some successful business. And technology only has real value when you solve a real problem. So the parachute saves your life, right? But if you, so it's understanding the customer's problems and doing a better job to solve them than the incumbent suppliers uh, and so on. And then uh, one of the things about me is I try to be brutally honest. Um, it causes me a lot of trouble sometimes. But brutal honesty is about what do I honestly think? It doesn't mean I'm right, it just means these are my opinions. Now challenge them. And within the team we have a culture of challenging each other. Okay? So we have, we've got this ability of challenging ourselves and going through, but be honest, be realistic, be down to earth, be pragmatic. And the best person to challenge me, of course, is my wife. Uh, we get on very well. So partners are also very, very helpful. Firm feet on the ground in your partner is another good idea. Um, and then the other thing is, as a startup, you need the best finance people. You need the best lawyers, but you can't afford them. But what you can do, you can get them part time. And so the, the first finance director of ARM was a guy called Peng Wong, who was from Malaysia originally. He uh, had been my finance director at ES2, and I got him doing the finance work for me part-time. Then when we could afford him, we hired him. The founding lawyer of ARMS, a guy called David McKay, he was Acorn's lawyer, and the patent agents and so on. So you are, as, again in the team, you are as weak as the weakest link, and it's the same in the football team, if the goalkeeper's no good, you've got a problem, right? So you need every position covered. And then the other thing is, if the team is really good, and I think we did this with ARM, the team, you say there's 12 people in the team, you should get an output greater than 12 if the team is working well, right? So this is called synergy. So I believe in a really good team, that's what you want to do. Teams that are not so good, you've got 12 people and you get an output of four if you're lucky, right? And a lot of nonsense is talked right? that, That's what most of real life does. And the larger the company, the harder it is to be successful. So a small team is easier than, 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 than a large team. The bigger it gets, the more people involved, the more communication problems you have. And then the other thing is you need different people at different times. So I'm very happily retired from one, but the people there are very good. And, and so it's like football players, at a certain age, you want to change, you want to do something else. So be honest about rotating people, <laughs> changing people, and so on and so forth. And then the other thing which I really do believe in, this is why I'm doing music now, and see how impossible it is, think beyond the possible and back off to reality. Okay, you're gonna get a song later. And you, you can tell me the honest truth, by the way. If you don't like the song, you can tell me I'm not good. Okay, some observations. People often focus too much on technology push rather than customer pull, and that's the classic engineering mistake. 
The first purchase orders and setting them up is the most important thing to do. If a customer will pay you for something and you make some margin out of it, you've probably got the right answers and the right solution. If you haven't got any customers, start to get Purchase orders are the most important thing. And to succeed, you have to be the world's best at something. It doesn't mean you're the world's best at everything, but in our case, it was mixed for what, mixed for dollar, and then an embedded call. Unless you focus to be the world's best at something, I'd say don't bother. Life's too short. Team is as weak as the weakest link. This is the other thing that's hard as a boss. When you promote somebody, you believe in them, and they're not delivering, and it's hard to be realistic about firing them or changing them. But be as brutally honest as you can be. And then I also believe in every board decision I'm on was unanimous. We would debate everything. We'd have violent arguments. People, consultants would come in and say, this is the rudest board meeting we've ever been to. That's because we were being honest. And then the other thing about venture capital money is time to money in venture capital. Most venture capitalists, they want to see a return on investment in four or five years' time. But in a hardware-related technology business, to get real value, it takes a lot longer. That's one of their problems. So if you can get angel investment that's got a longer term horizon, you probably get a better, better chance. And then understand your total ecosystem. So just an example of that. So we're selling chips to Texas Instruments. Nokia are uh, using those chips in their phones. Vodafone is the operator. There's services and applications that go on top of that. See the whole picture because the devil is in the detail. And if you're just looking at a little piece, something will happen that you didn't expect. That's what I mean about the whole ecosystem. And then this is another message for today that I've realized. So, in business, you know, call me right back, get the purchase order overnight. The, the pace of business and making decisions is very quick and it's global and it's real time 24 7. World of academia is a bit different because you're working on a long term project, you've got more time. You're doing a your project, it takes several years maybe, it can run at a slow space until it's going to the critical time where you've got to get your PhD. And the world of politics, uh, something I don't understand, but and we, signed, we, signed, we decided to do something and it still looks like we don't know what we're doing in a political one. So what I've realised is, it's not that business is right or politics is right or academia is right. What I say is just recognise the differences and try and be honest about where they work together and they run at different speeds. And then keep it simple and learn by doing, and beware the drug of funding. What I mean by that is, you just keep getting the money from Brussels to do the project and actually you're not doing anything really, it's the drug of funding. Okay, so where is on today? So I retired from Army in 2007, but more than 100 billion chips shipped. The most popular microprocessor architecture on the planet. Arm has recently signed a license agreement with the Chinese to do the world's fastest supercomputer. So that's pretty nice. I didn't expect that to happen, really. Uh, more than five billion, just about everybody's connected with ARM chips. You know, people need to be woken up by their, their Apple alarm clock or get their email or their WhatsApp messages. So we have seriously impacted the world. In some cases, one of the things that made me feel really good, I was in Morocco in a very poor village, and people were using their mobile phones with ARM chips for commerce and improving the quality of their lives. Again, things like controlling water. So there are many nice applications of ARM technology, and I'm actually going to a talk that ARM is hosting with UNESCO at St. James's Palace on Tuesday, trying to use technology to improve the world. Uh, always on, always connected. Storage in the cloud are very important today, and it worries me that nobody thinks about that. Internet of Things is the new buzzword. Um, it basically means everything's connected to everything, but it's okay until the security goes wrong and somebody steals your car and the cloud collapses and you don't know where you are. But there's an opportunity there. And then the other thing I'm quite personally pleased about is the Raspberry Pi, which is another Cambridge startup, and the micro bit are getting programmable microcomputers into the kids' hands, and I've got a couple of Raspberry Pis because I like playing in my lab. So uh, that's, that's where I'm is today. Now, looking to the future, and this is where I am personally, if I look at the startups that I'm involved in, they're not doing what ARM is doing, they're doing some new stuff. So, one of the things that matter for the world of tomorrow, energy efficiency, right? We waste so much energy, whether it's air conditioning or heating or lighting or whatever, that's a big area. Security, I don't think we even start to think about the reality of security. I think everybody takes it all for granted, but potentially it's a nightmare. It's also an opportunity if you've got stuff in one with hardware, software, clouds. Healthcare, another big area. Servers, right? The amount of these servers that, you, that serve Google and Facebook, they actually run them next to power stations because they take so much power. Connectivity, robotics and artificial intelligence, cloud and machine learning, 
on the internet of things. So the other good news is for kids who are graduating today, there's even more great stuff to do because when when healthcare and medicine cross, so the world is just starting in terms of this technology. There's lots of great stuff going on. So Sentinel City, I don't know if you know about it, but I visited visited Sentinel City the other day. It's just down the road. The idea is it's about sensors and connecting things and doing great stuff and startups. It's on your doorstep in Liverpool. It's fantastic. I personally put some money into the Royal Academy of Engineering's Enterprise Hub. The Academy of Engineering has been good at creating PhDs and professors and all the rest of it, but haven't this been so good at creating jobs? The good news is we've got about 80 startups and we mentor, and again, if you think of a startup, you can get free help and you can go and hot desk and what have you. And then the other thing, and this is the kind of joke, and it's because it's Christmas, and this is my new, new hobby. I have many new hobbies. Um, <coughs> Basically what happened is I was the after dinner speaker at University College London, 31st, 5th gala dinner of the computer science department. And I thought the last thing the kids need is an after dinner speech. So two and a half years ago, there's a guy called Carrie who plays guitar uh, from Ghana, and there's a girl called Nina from Brazil. And I went over and said, will you help me out of a jail? I'm going to try and give my lesson to, my speech to music. And we turned the evening into Blues Brothers. So then Carrie said, why don't you write some songs and come into the studio? I've got Yumi as my piano teacher here. So I started my piano lessons with Yumi a couple of years ago. And what I'm going to do, I, and, I, and somebody, I gave a lecture last week at the university, and somebody said, can I get your song somewhere? So in the last week, I've put some songs up in Bandcamp. So if you want to download these songs, they're all up there. It's robinandfriends.bandcamp.com and you can rate me and do it. And what I'm going to do now is, as it's Christmas, and as I love Liverpool, the song I've decided for tonight is Che Che Liverpool. Okay, so Che Che Coule is a Ghanaian folk song, which is like for the kids. It's like hide and seek, up and down, Che Che Coule. So that's carry. And then it's Che Che Coule meets Liverpool. And what you'll get here is my story. You have to listen carefully for the words. I met my wife here. So to this place, bombed out, yeah, total disgrace, investment post-war, the key to an open door, lived in Roscoe Hall with central heating, to welcome those I'm greeting, Bachelor of Engineering, apt labelling, but friendships, most enabling. of all genres every night plastic glasses to avoid the fight bass guitarist with a scar in the triton bar the who played for us broke guitar duke ellington too peter green's blues such a cool liverpool my spiritual home a sanctuary when i'm all alone
songs, one of them has lines like age is just a number, don't let it get you down. So you can tell my age doesn't get me down at all. In fact, I've got more freedom at my age to do more what I want. So thank you for listening. We're all different. We've all got skill. Every human is really important. You just got to work out what it is you want to do. And if you can, you got a chance. And I wish you all lots of luck. Thank you. Sharing that um, your song, it probably could be a, a theme song for the electrical engineering department.